Illinois Stories is brought to you by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by the support of viewers like you. Thank you. Hello, welcome to Illinois Stories. I'm Mark McDonald in Macomb at the Western Illinois University Archives where we have a chance to go through some of the materials that are being used in a new documentary that's being put together right now about one of McDonough County's most notorious residents. You may recall the book, The Bootlegger by John Hallwiss about Kelly Wagle, a man who made and lost several fortunes bootlegging. Well, now it's being turned into a documentary by Ryan Walker, who is from Macomb, went to Western for some time, mm -hmm. went away, learned some skills in filmmaking, and have come back to do this film. What gets you interested about the bootlegger? Well, um, when I was at Western, I worked at Copperfield's Bookstore, which is on the square. And uh, when the book came out, um, I remember what a sensation it was. Um, I was probably 20 years old, and I think we sold 1,700 copies in a year, something mm -hmm, like that. Mm -hmm. It was just off the charts. We'd never seen anything like it. Um, I didn't read it at the time, but uh, it, w it took about another 10 years for me to read it. Um, when I was a filmmaker and was looking for something to do, I uh, happened to be here driving through Colchester, going to Argyle Lake, and uh, looking around thinking, this place is so photogenic. If, uh, if you're a history buff, uh, you can just see the history lying around everywhere, uh, mm -hmm. in ruins and, and still standing sometimes. So, and it just hit me um, out of nowhere. What about the bootlegger? Has anybody, I didn't know, is there a movie already out there? Mm -hmm. Is somebody making mm -hmm. it? Is it optioned? Um, so I started, I contacted John Hallwiss and, and went from there. Mm -hmm. and, and you and your wife Katie are working on this film, right? Mm -hmm. And you're, you're getting it pretty well wrapped up. You've shot the better part of it, haven't you? Yeah, we're getting the shooting wrapped up. Mm -hmm. um, we're in the acquisition <laughs> phase right now. We're getting as many photos and, and uh, shots and interviews and yeah. newspaper articles as we can. Um, but the post-production is just hasn't begun yet. Yeah. So yeah. Um, that it might take a year. It could mm -hmm. take three years. Mm -hmm. It's hard to say. Yeah. But, uh, but you spent a lot of time in Colchester recently, haven't you? Yeah. yeah <laughs> Let's take a look at our subject here because a lot of people may not have heard of Kelly Waggle. Um, this is him, uh, oh, in his, in his middle age years. Um, what I mentioned he was a notorious resident of McDonough County. What him made him notorious? Well, um, it was the age of the, the gangster hero. Um, and we're here in Illinois where Al Capone is famous, but uh, Kelly Wiggle might be the small town version of Al Capone if you, if you want mm -hmm. if you want to say so. Um, but so he was a boisterous guy. Um, he liked attention. He would uh, he would go to the county fair and, and ride in the mule races and loved to make a spectacle of himself. Mm -hmm. um, he was a really popular guy. He also had a big temper, so a lot of people feared him. So he, uh, you know, he was he was a big personality. Um, at, and in the 20s, he had a lot of money. He used to, you know, do things for people in town. So he was popular mm -hmm. that way, like a lot of gangsters you were. You can see Colchester was at one time a thriving community. It was uh, when we go to visit it today, we're going to find that a lot of the buildings are vacant and haven't been inhabited for some time. But you can see here that it was a thriving community, particularly shortly after the train went through. Right, and uh, I mean, there you don't see the crowds like you used to downtown, but it, it is still a thriving place. Um, that's something that surprised me because I thought the, the, fir the same thing when I first got there that, oh, this is a dying town and it's, it's almost a ghost town. But after spending time there, I realized that this is, town is very much alive. Mm -hmm. People have been saying it's dead for 150 years and it's, it's holding steady with its population. It, it has an unusual history, though, too, I mean, and a great place, place for a bootlegger because even before national prohibition, Colchester flirted with prohibition in a number of different periods, didn't it? Yeah, it was a notorious saloon place. Um, coal mining and saloons seem to go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. And um, it was a really rowdy, wild, rough place. Uh, girls weren't allowed to walk around there because it was so dangerous. Mm -hmm. um, but so, And that's one reason why the temperance movement started. They said, this is out of control. Our, we're not safe to walk down the street. Mm -hmm. So it went back and forth. No saloon, saloon, no saloon. And uh, that's where bootleggers like Kelly um, mm -hmm. came from because there was a market. Let's take another look at Kelly in an earlier time. Now this is him that says in his teen years, he was an old looking teenager there, but, but uh, he certainly doesn't look like anybody that anybody be afraid of. <laughs> and, and in fact, we're gonna learn from you and your wife, he was uh, much a well-loved person as well as a feared person. Absolutely, I mean, and uh, I think more so as time goes by, and he, you know, he died 80 plus years ago, 
Um, for some reason, the good things that he did and the kind deeds he did are remembered very prominently mm -hmm. and some of the darker parts of his life aren't talked about so much. So, um, and we get it, we'll get into that in the yeah, movie. Yeah. Well, let's go down to Colchester and, and you can take us on sort of a walking tour, take us to some of the places where you shot some of your footage and uh, you know, maybe we'll run into somebody interviewed, who knows? Okay, sounds good. Okay. Ryan, I'll bet you walked all over this town, didn't you? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, many times. <laughs> and uh, what I've asked you to do is show us what you found, the mm -hmm. things that interested you about Colchester. Uh, and it, it, as we look over your shoulder, we can see that, that big old blue water tower, which identifies mm -hmm. it. But there are a lot of other things that identify Colchester, in your mind anyway, from having spent the last several months here walking around. Yeah. Um, well, when I first wanted to do uh, some kind of film version of the book, I, there's a lot of maps in the book, old maps. So I, um, I knew some of the landmarks, and I, as I'm reading, I'm, I'm thinking, oh, I know that house, or I know that, that turn in the road, but uh, there's certain things I wanted to find, like, is the depot still there? Because it's a big, uh, part of, uh, big part of the town's culture mm -hmm. was the railroad and, and the, this downtown area. So I took out the book, I drove down here, and I was trying to find the depot, and I, I, thought, I thought it was right around here somewhere, and I'm looking, and I'm thinking, is that it? Well, that, the white building doesn't really look like it. It looks too uh -oh. new. Uh -oh. And, um, you know, I was kind of walking around, and I was on the other side of this tracks, actually, but started finding, um, you know, this sunken brick sidewalk. Mm -hmm. And over there, it's even more covered up. So it's just kind of a, a brick here and there poking Weed out through dirt the grass. And, yeah, you can just barely make it out, huh? Yeah, and, um, you know, that, you know, heart starts racing, and uh, just... That was really exciting to me to kind of just discover something, walking around and, oh, here it is, you know, and I didn't have somebody there to point it out to mm -hmm. me. I just um, was finding stuff and was walking around and felt like an archaeologist almost, yeah. you know, just, and... Um, this is your dig here. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm looking around, I find old railroad spikes and fragments of pottery and all these, you know, traces of history just buried and lying around here and that just really fascinated yeah. me. And that was kind of the, that launched kind of what I wanted to do and that um, you know I just tried to follow stuff that excited me you know what what's what moved me about the story um, so that this yeah. kind of kick-started well, the whole thing uh, you know folks here in Colchester don't don't pay any attention to this anymore it's obvious but at one time this would have been this was here because it provided a main walkway to the depot this is probably yeah. one of the busiest sidewalks in town and actually it's still people walking their dogs or taking their evening stroll will uh, take this path still it goes all the way up and down through town, goes mm -hmm. to the old, one of the oldest churches in town, just a block down there. So mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's still used a lot to this day. Yeah. Okay, so the depot is no longer here. It would have been on one, on one of the two sides of these tracks right here. And as, if we go, look over this way, this is a really good, uh, a good chance to see this side of the town, of the tracks. And, and there was a time when Colchester would have been a, a thriving community, but uh, boy, there's a lot of vacant places, aren't there? Yeah. Um, and it's, you know, it's a typical situation. A lot of, uh, even in Macomb, it's the same kind of situation. Um, towns all over the Midwest, and I'm sure all over the country are in the same situation. You know, the economy was built on, um, in this case, coal um, mm -hmm. and then clay mining. Um, but whatever it might be in these different towns, the, the economy has changed, the industries have changed. So it's, you know, we're looking at the shell of, uh, you know, what was a way of life 100 years ago, 150 years ago. Mm -hmm. Coal, then of course the trains came to get the coal out, then the trains came to bring people in. But all, through it all, there was Kelly moving booze, right? <laughs> yeah, he, uh, he started in uh, close to 1910 um, selling booze because here in town they would vote. Uh, there was the anti-saloon, or the, um, the saloons would come up for their license and every year it would be voted in, voted out, voted in, voted out. Yeah. Um, and same with all the nearby towns. So, um, you know, he took advantage of that, getting booze over here where it's legal, taking it over here where it's illegal, mm -hmm. and making money. Uh, he was kind of small time for a long time, and uh, there would be beer camps outside of town. Um, and, uh, you know, over time when it, when it became national prohibition, the market expanded to the whole country. Mm -hmm. So. He, he had a lot of practice by the time uh, 1919 rolled yeah, around. Yeah. Let's go see some more. Okay. Ryan, I guess Colchester's been 
been dry since the 30s, but it wasn't that way all the time. It was on and off and on and off, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and I'm, as far as I know, this stretch here was, there were a lot of saloons uh, right in this block here. And um, Colchester had a fire bug um, at the early part of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. They had a lot of major fires, so many of the old buildings are burned down. Uh, one right next to where that Pepsi sign is, there was a huge fire right here and the cigar factory burned down. Oh, is that but, right? Um, so some of these buildings are newer, but this would have been uh, one of the wildest spots in town on a Saturday night. Saloon Row. Yeah. And, and, and probably a lot of them got their booze from, from Kelly Wagle, I'll bet. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. Well, not when the saloons were in business. He wouldn't have uh, supplied the legal saloons. He had been uh, yeah. in yeah, business when was... they were out of business. Yeah, right, bootlegger would, but of course he would have been supplying other places that were dry at the time. Right. So he was, that was his, that was his stock and trade. He became a wealthy man, didn't he? Well, depends on what you mean by wealthy. I mean, for, for this town, he was wealthy, um, uh, but maybe not compared to, you know, Al Capone or somebody like no. that. I don't think he was a millionaire or anything like that, but um, for this area, he was, he was doing pretty well for himself in yeah. the 20s. When you, when you came here to talk to people, uh, it, it's not too long ago now that some people would have known him. Uh, did, what, did, what opinion did you hear about Kelly? Well, almost everyone I talk to has, not, has good things to say about him. He's, they'll call him a, a Robin Hood figure. Hmm. Um, he's, he seems to be a, a hero uh, to a lot of people. Hmm. And he's, you know, they'd, when they were kids, they'd hear stories from their, their folks about him. And, or maybe from the other side of the story for, for um, temperance people, he might have been a, you know, a darker figure who was uh, out to get you or something. I don't know. But I haven't really talked to many people that say that. I think uh, he's been dead for over 80 years and uh, seems like the more time passes, the more heroic he seems to be to, mm -hmm. to the people around here. Orion, this would have been one of the main intersections uh, even, even back then. Mm -hmm. um, and this building here, this is interesting because when you, had, your, when you were, uh, had, had all your equipment in one place, you had a little office down here where you were gathering up your, uh, the stuff you were shooting and your data and your interviews and stuff. And you had an office in this building. Yeah, for about five months uh, in the corner here. Yeah. Um, had an office and, uh, you know, had my, edit, my editing gear in there. And uh, it was neat to be able to look out and see the trains going by and, and kind of see things, the comings and goings of people in town and really get the, the rhythms of life here. Yeah, which, yeah. Uh, you know, before I was coming from Macomb, and it's a totally different feeling being here every day mm -hmm. and feeling like a, a neighbor instead of, you know, an outsider coming in and kind of poking a camera at people. It's, yeah. it's way different to be here daily. Yeah. And, what, uh, what was this building originally used for? Um, it, was, uh, it was a general store uh, built in the 1880s and uh, the Terrell family at first, uh, I don't know which was first, it was Terrell, Terrell and Sons and then it was Terrell Brothers and then Terrell and Holsons. Uh, it was in business for probably a hundred years or so. And uh, at one time, for decades, it was the biggest business in McDonough County mm -hmm. back in the 1800s. So. Mm -hmm. and, and, and Kelly had a tie-in here, didn't he? Yeah, some of his, uh, his third wife worked here, I believe <laughs> after he died. Um, <laughs> okay. And uh, her, her husband after him, he, he was a butcher and he, I think he worked here as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's, there's ghosts. When I was uh, <laughs> working there, I'd think, you know, I'm standing right where Blanche used to stand or, mm -hmm. or Cecil or, and uh, you know, this part's finished, but in the back, it's all, exposed brick and um, leaking and stuff. So it was uh, really cool to be in a historic space like that. Well, the, the Terrell building that we were discussing is right behind us. Mm -hmm. So we're on the block behind that. Yeah. And, and the reason we wanted to come here is because this was probably the most significant thing that happened in Kelly's life. Well, <laughs> it ended his life. Yeah. Uh, we're on Macomb Street here. And um, it was actually, a, uh, the anniversary of his death was yesterday. April 8th, but uh, he was with some buddies down at the mechanic shop across the street from his house, which is just across the main road. And uh, for once, he didn't have his bodyguards with him or his bodyguard. And uh, he came up here to uh, buy a cigar. And uh, there was a store over here? A soda fountain right over here. Uh -huh. it used to be the fraternity building here, the biggest building in town, the most grand building in town, which was destroyed in the 70s. Uh, so now it's a big parking lot, but he uh, got his cigar, he came back this way. And there was a, uh, a Ford Roadster, uh, a green Ford Roadster was right here. And there was a guy, I think, as far as I know, was probably leaning over the, leaning on the hood of the car, kind of hidden. Uh -huh. And uh, 
had been following him for days, and uh, he got he shot him three times with a shotgun, and uh, he uh, was carried into the fraternity building. There was a doctor in there. His his buddies heard the shots. They ran out. The killer sped away and out east of town, and uh, Kelly was carried up into the to the doctor's office and died within probably five ten minutes. Mm -hmm. He usually had security with him. He but didn't. On, on this day, he was just walking. Yeah, he and a, another guy were had been trying to kill each other for, for a while. Yeah. A year or two, they'd been at each other's throats. And, and this was so, an arrival, probably a, another bootlegger, probably. They were, yeah, a guy he used to be partners with, and um, they had had a falling out, so they were there was a lot of drama there. And so he he felt in danger. He told a lot of people he was, he was doomed. He thought he had it coming. Um, so he didn't like to travel alone, but this yeah. one time he... he uh, for one block, he was by himself, and uh, that's what did it. Yeah. Katie, you're going to get credits on this film, right? Yes, I mean, yes. you're the producer. I'm the producer. The, in, in my mind, the producer is the one that's sort of in charge of content. Mm -hmm. You know, you, 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 this is what's going to be involved. This is where the content's going to take us. This is what we hope to learn. This is where we're going to shoot. Yeah, these kind yeah. of locations yeah. and those kinds of things. Who we're going to interview. So you had a lot to do with this project. Yeah. In fact, you did some of the shooting too, yes, right? Yes. Okay, so you're a photographer as well. <laughs> yeah. I asked you to come over here in front of Kelly's house, which yeah. is right over your shoulder. Yes. And this was his new house, right? Yes. What yes. happened to his old house? His old house in the early 1920s burnt down, and so he built this one, which was the house he was living in when he was killed. So it's, and then his widow lived there afterwards. He, so. was, he was on his way home from getting his cigar and his pop, yep. right, yep. when he got killed. Yep, walking on the way home. Yeah. It was just about a block away. And yeah. Didn't get there. No. In, in your research uh, mm -hmm. on this property, and he these houses weren't here. He owned this block. Yeah, he owned here all the way over to the church. Over uh huh. There. In, in your research, you found some interesting things. Yeah, yeah. There, well, and also talking to people with the rumors all about him. They, there was rumors that he hid booze and tunnels that were all going on around here. And, really. And he had a vault in the basement, which was everyone thought was really cool. <laughs> well, what, did any? Yeah. Did you find any evidence of any of that? Not of the tunnels. We did see the vault and looked inside it. There were some rumors that it, there was a tunnel behind it, but it had a... Yeah. It but had there a was back. a vault in the basement. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. mm -hmm. And what about the tunnels? Any, any indication there were any tunnels? Um, someone over across the block over there said that he had to dig up his yard and he, he found, found a tunnel going to the church, but we have yet to see proof yet. It's that gray moment. and beige house over there, that big house? Mm -hmm. the, he dug up his yard and he found a tunnel. The blue one, yeah. Oh, blue one, okay. Yeah. And it went under the road? Yes, yeah, supposedly. Well, that's we pretty good indication there was yeah. something going <laughs> yeah, on. I yeah. mean, if he if he says there's a tunnel under the road, I yeah. tend to believe him, right? Yeah. What did you learn about Kelly Nagel? Did you find him to be an interesting person? I did. Oh, Wagle, I, I'm sorry. Well, I thought, it, I thought it was really fascinating, the different stories about him, how everyone kind of revered him because he, he, he helped out the community a lot. If someone was sick, he'd take him to the doctor. He'd pay. He'd go to the movie theater and pay for the kids' tickets to get inside. Yeah. And so he was really well known for his good, good qualities. But also he was, you know, a criminal. He he was selling booze during a time where it was not legal, yeah. and there was a lot of tension about that. Yeah. And, yeah. and it was just it's fascinating the. You know, he sold booze when it wasn't illegal, but De depends he on who you talk yeah, to, right? Yeah, exactly. Some people it would, they, it doesn't bother them. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yep. Well, Katie, about oh, about two blocks, I guess. Yeah. From yeah. Kelly's home, uh, was his church, and this was a what a, a Methodist church Methodist, at the time. Yeah. Um, well, after he got shot. Yeah. That he, is, they had his funeral here. Yep. This. Is I where guess this town probably at. never saw anything like that before. Well, they've seen funerals, but not to that capacity. Uh, it was rumored that a thousand, even more people showed up from all over. Uh, people here all went, and then from out town, it was rumored that a Capone came. Really? And uh, in the book, it's really well described as a parade of cars coming into town to the funeral. And they were upstairs in the basement, all surrounding. Um, and there's said to be a blanket of roses on his casket. Really? Yep. So he was, he was 
well known and yeah. a, a big big person in this community and yeah. so he had a really big funeral to prove that. A thousand, if there were a thousand people present that that church would probably hold about a hundred comfortably. Yeah, yeah. Uh, of course there was an upper floor and a basement but I mean mm -hmm. that wouldn't do you much good then. They didn't have video feeds. I don't no, think, no so. I don't think so. <laughs> so. So they were yeah they were all outside. My goodness I, that's that's surprising. Yeah. I don't imagine Colchester ever uh, ever experienced anything like that before. I, I think it's one of the biggest funerals they've ever had. It, so. it kind of goes to to your point too about the the man was was loved and hated at the same mm -hmm. time. Yeah. Yeah. So he was pretty loved for all the people that He's, showed up. He, yes, he was, and, and and maybe a lot of those people were glad to see him dead too. Yeah, that, that's true. <laughs> Wanted to prove. <laughs> Ryan, before before he met his maker, he had been in jail several times. It wasn't like he had this 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 career where he was able to to escape the law all his life. He spent some time in jail too, didn't he? He did. Um, he spent, uh, I think, six months in the jail in Macomb. Uh, he was arrested a lot of times, but usually got off. Uh, he had a knack for getting around the law. Um, mm -hmm. It helped that a lot of powerful people were his customers. Uh, city councilmen. <laughs> oh, is that right? They didn't want the source of the booze to be out of the, out of the, out of the business, huh? Right. <laughs> That's hilarious. Um, so actually, he was more, he thrived more. His business was better before Prohibition, right? Because he was servicing these small areas where... I think it really picked up big time after National Prohibition because then the market was everywhere. Because before that, he was building his clientele. Yeah. He could build, buy it in one county and take it to another county. But after that, I mean, go to Chicago, you could get yeah, booze yeah. from and, and he Chicago. already had a network set up and he mm -hmm. had his source set up, so he already had a distribution network set up. Yeah, he distributed all over yeah. the Midwest. Yeah. Um, uh, Omaha, you know, Iowa, Illinois all over the place. One thing we haven't talked about is is how you got started doing this and and I know that you you looked at various ways okay now how can I raise enough money to put a documentary together because obviously your time is worth something <laughs> right so you have to have like you to have to so. have some seed money on this thing how does yeah. how'd that work? Uh, well I, um, I raised some money on kickstarter.com which is a, a pretty common these days for filmmakers and artists and musicians um, to crowdfund their their work by um, creating a short video and then contacting their social networks and uh, oh, okay. raising money that way. Uh, and there were also uh, donors uh, outside of that who, who stepped forward and, and chipped in and, and we're, we're still raising money because mm -hmm. the, the project keeps growing. Yeah, so, so on Kickstarter, and I'm not real familiar with that, what you do is you put your idea out there and like you say, if you have any video that you shot that supports your idea, and then you ask people who want to get involved with funding the arts, mm -hmm. they can do it individually. Right, it's, um, it's a it's kind of less risk for everybody involved. Uh, it's a it's a new newer model where, you know, if 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 you're a fan of of this kind of documentary, and you want to see it happen, you can put money up front, then and then the, it happens. Mm -hmm. so, and otherwise, uh, the filmmaker would have to go to um, through different avenues to raise money. And if they don't get it, it, it mm -hmm. never happens. So it's mm -hmm. kind of going straight to the audience instead of to um, funders you're going straight to your market. You already have people, friends of yours in place who know about writing music for films, who know about post-production, who know about editing, who, who, who can help you do this. Where is it in that process? Well um, we're uh, almost done shooting and uh, we'll start post-production here in a month or so. I've got a fr uh, several friends already working on it. Mark Speckman um, has agreed to write some music for it. He's a, a good friend and does some really neat music. Mm -hmm. um, I've got uh, a couple other friends who've agreed to do sound design and um, animations, graphics, and stuff like mm -hmm. that. Um, and I'll probably do most of the editing myself, but it's a long process. Who knows what's going to happen? Mm -hmm. um, the the more talented people I can bring on board to help, the better the movie's going to be. I'm not trying to do everything myself, um, so uh, it's going to take a, a long list of people yeah. to, to make this a good film. Yeah, yeah. Um, are you looking at, a, do you have a, a length, a, a tape running time length in, in, in mind? Um, not more than 90 minutes, not under 60, mm -hmm. somewhere so in there. So be a full length. Mm -hmm. Wow, terrific. That's a lot of work. That post-production, <laughs> that, that could take a year, I guess, couldn't it? It could take years, yeah. yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, you never know. Um, and it's still, I still get revelations working on it. So new things pop up, new people mm -hmm. contact me and say, hey, you got to come take a look at this or talk to this person. Or So I, yeah. I, I try to be open to to let it grow. Yeah, yeah. Well, you've been working on it a long time. A little more time doesn't hurt, right? Right. I mean, the, <laughs> the worst thing I could do is uh, say it's done when it's not ready. Yeah. You know, I want it to be right. as good as it can be. Yeah. Ryan, thank you.
Sure. And, and another a, a personal note, if you're interested in getting involved in this production, uh, in Colchester on April 24th, they'll be hosting what's called the Bootlegger Barbecue to celebrate the, uh, the finished part of, of this film, the shooting uh, part of this film. With another Illinois story in Macomb and Colchester, I'm Mark McDonald. Thanks for watching. Illinois Stories is brought to you by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by the support of viewers like you. Thank you. For a DVD copy of the program you've just seen, send 1995 to Network Knowledge, P.O. Box 6248, Springfield, Illinois 62708. Be sure to include the program name, subject, and when the program aired. You can also order with your credit card by calling 800-232-3605.